The current theory that Neanderthals and other ancient humans were an inferior, archaic, or otherwise peculiar side branch of humanity, which eventually became extinct without descendants, has its origins in anti-evolutionary interpretations placed upon the available hominid fossils, by the French paleontologist Marcelin Belli in the early part of the last century. The theoretical basis of hominid catastrophism stems from the early 19th century position of Georges Cuvier, who attempted to explain the sequence in the fossil record by a series of catastrophes, with attendant extinctions and subsequent invasions of different forms of prehistoric humans. Even without specifically labeling it as such, Belli applied this concept of hominid catastrophism to explain the sequence of forms in the hominid fossil record, assuming that none of the fossil men discovered, which differed from modern man, could be regarded as ancestral to the modern human lineage. Geneticists estimate that we had a common ancestor with the Neanderthal lineage probably more than 500,000 years ago. But who that ancestor was and where that ancestor lived, I think now is, is much less certain than I used to think. I used to think the common ancestor was a species called Homo heidelbergensis. Um, and now I'm, I'm not sure about that and I'm not sure what continent that common ancestor lived on. It may have been in Europe, it may have been in Asia, it, it may have been in Africa. Man's forehead is the mirror of his intelligence, archaeologist Ralph von Koenigswald wrote in his work, Meeting Prehistoric Man. Human fossils are sometimes referred to as Neanderthaloid that have large Neanderthal-like features, such as large brow ridges, large eye sockets and low-vaulted, elongated brain cases. The supraorbital torus, or brow ridge, is a very distinctive morphological trait in most of our hominin ancestors, but what purpose does this feature serve? One of the hypotheses around this topic is a signaling effect, accentuating aggressive stares, thus its large size could have been sexually selected through generations. Ancient human skulls, such as Homo erectus, have a much larger brow ridge than the minimum required to fulfill spatial demands, and its size has little impact on mechanical performance during biting. However, some large brow ridges are hollowed inside, suggesting that they did not bear or transmit physical forces from blows to the head. Many researchers once considered ancient man only capable of primitive reasoning, and animalistic brutality. Darkness characterized the being to which the fossil belonged and the thoughts and desires which once dwelt within it never soared beyond those of the brute, one early anthropologist observed of the crania of ancient man. Scientists believe that genes and an all-meat diet contributed to their robust body, the result of a life spent stabbing hippos and rhinos to death and deconstructing their carcasses. Their minds were more primitive, therefore they most likely hunted with animalistic savagery. Nevertheless, the ancient blood that once surged through this long extinct group of archaic humans, had more in common with modern humans than scientists once believed. Archaeologists discovered an incredible fossil, the bones of what appeared to be an ancient human, surrounded by animal remains and shells. Excavated in the 1890s, the site became famous as the home of Java Man, also known as Homo erectus today. The bones, which were discovered between a million and 700,000 years ago, sparked to date because Dubois claimed they showed evidence of a transitional species between apes and humans. Homo erectus fossils have since been discovered in Africa, and other parts of Asia, and it is possible that the species is a direct ancestor of our own. Because of their overlapping morphology and evolutionary relationship, some anthropologists recognize them as subspecies of Homo sapiens, known as Homo sapiens erectus. Homo erectus first appeared on the Indonesian island of Java at least 1.8 million years ago, when Java was connected to Asia by a land bridge. Yet this date has far-reaching implications for our understanding of the first out-of-Africa human migrations. The migration of Homo erectus in Southeast Asia during the early Pleistocene is critical to our understanding of human evolution. Yet the limited consideration of the rapidly changing physical environment, combined with contentious datings of hominin-bearing sites, makes securing the robust timeline required to reveal the behavior of early humans difficult. According to another recent study, researchers discovered that Homo erectus arrived in Java 1.8 million years ago. But the big question is when and how Homo erectus spread throughout Southeast Asia. 
Homo erectus inhabited an open woodland environment much cooler than present-day Java, along with elephants, tigers, wild cattle, water buffalo, tapirs, and hippopotamuses, among other megafauna. Indeed, it appears that early human hunters in Java enjoyed the taste of hippopotamuses. They manufactured simple flakes and choppers, handheld stone tools, and possibly spears or harpoons from bones, daggers from stingray stingers, as well as bolus or hammerstones from andesite. Yes, only a few implements were found at the Solo River site. The most interesting objects were spheres of volcanic rock, completely round like cannon balls and the same size. Similar spheres are known from the site of Rhodesian Man in South Africa, and from association with the Neanderthaler in southern France, among others. It has been assumed that these are missiles, and it is very remarkable that such implements should have been found both in Africa and Europe in levels of approximately the same age as our Javanese deposits. A few ray spines also discovered in Java, were doubtless used as spearheads or daggers, as is still done in the South Seas. This site, now dated to a mere 118,000 years old, just after the last full interglacial warm period, is one of the most important discoveries of ancient man. In a site nearby, which is the same age but has yielded no remains of primitive man, a hippopotamus skull was found, accompanied by a bone spearhead almost 8 inches long, and clearly an imitation in bone of one of these ray spines. Nearby, at another site which has yielded no remains of primitive man, a hippopotamus skull was found accompanied by a bone spearhead almost 8 inches long, and clearly an imitation in bone of one of the sea ray spines found there. A few ray spines also discovered were doubtless used as spearheads or daggers, as is still done in the South Seas. In all, archaeologists found no less than 11 cranial remains of ancient man at the Solo River site. Of the skeletons only two shin bones, which, incidentally, did not differ in any way from those of modern man, had come to light. But there were no lower jaws, no teeth, no vertebrae or other bones, von Koenigswald wrote. Ancient man is known to have been a cannibal. This practice had been born of a deadly seriousness, of life and death, of man versus nature, as shown by gruesome evidence of ancient cannibalistic events. In the East, Peking man was found to have possessed one very human trait, he was a cannibal. All the skulls were smashed, the area around the occipital foramen was broken away in order to extract the brain, and there was even a femur that had been split lengthways to get at the marrow. Von Koenigswald wrote that the skeleton cult appears at a very early stage in human evolution, whether it already led to ancestor worship among prehistoric men we do not know. Preservation of the skull, regarded as the dwelling place of the spirit that would otherwise wander about, is the most primitive phase. The skulls of members of the tribe are gathered together and preserved at special places. We have seen that Peking man was a cannibal, and Java man a headhunter. Both ritual cannibalism, it cannot have been anything else here, since game was available in plenty and the practices of headhunters are rooted in magic and religion, and are signs of man's spiritual awakening, even though their precise significance is hard to establish. Von Koenigswald wrote that a vast number of different bones of all the animal types were unearthed, but of human remains only a very particular selection, whose incidence was certainly not natural. Looking at the skull ends as a whole it becomes evident what must have happened here. In all the skulls except two, the region of the foramen magnum is completely smashed, a phenomenon we have seen in Peking man fossils. If we examine the skull trophies of recent headhunters, we find that here, too, the region of the foramen magnum is severely damaged. The headhunter is not content merely to possess the skull, but opens it and takes out the brain, which he eats in order by this means to acquire the wisdom and skill of the defeated foe. What archaeologists had found in Java, therefore, were skull trophies. The huge accumulation of animal bones suggest we are dealing with a resting place of primitive men, strategically situated on a loop of the river. Here not only could they lie in wait for the animals that came to the river to drink, but they were also to some extent, though obviously not completely, safe from attacks by other members of their race. From the strata of sand and gravel, archaeologists assumed that primitive man camped here mainly in the dry season, 
and that the refuse they left behind was covered over with sand and gravel during the floods. Therefore, human skulls must have been left behind, whether intentionally, or unintentionally. Perhaps the ancient horde was taken by surprise and fled, or there was a flash flood, perhaps the skulls were put down to mark off the area. It seems that even recently various tribes in New Guinea demarcate their dwelling or hunting grounds in a similar manner. They evidently suppose that the spirit dwelling in the skull can help them to defend a particular area against invaders. Half a million years ago, Homo erectus in Java also created the oldest known shell tools. The palm-sized shells discovered alongside the human remains, however, are raising serious questions today. According to a study of the shells published in Nature, Homo erectus may have used them as tools and decorated some of them with geometric engravings. The shells, which are approximately half a million years old, are the earliest evidence of such decorative marks, as well as the first known use of shells to make tools. Archaeologists collected 11 freshwater shell species at the site. The majority of them are from a now extinct freshwater mussel. Scientists initially assumed that the mollusks had naturally clustered at the site, possibly due to water currents. Even without the human fossil, the cache provided a nice census of ancient freshwater shell life, with at least 166 pseudodon individuals. A group of scientists attempted to open the shells using the most likely pointy object available on Java, a shark tooth. Only by piercing the mussel were the shells opened without being broken. Because this requires a certain level of dexterity and knowledge, Homo erectus became the most likely suspect. The opening of shellfish by piercing the valve is unusual, and it has not been observed in either early Homo sapiens or Neanderthal middens, which are essentially shellfish trash dumps. The method suggests that if humans on Java opened the shells for food, they ate the shellfish raw. However, there's another reason Homo erectus could have been scraping mollusk shells. One specimen had been tampered with and was most likely used as a tool. The shell was visibly sharpened under a microscope, with striations from contact with hard material. Because the shell tool has a knife-like edge, we believe it was used for cutting and or scraping. Nevertheless, it's impossible to say what the shell was used for. A previous study suggested that cut marks on ancient bones discovered on Java were most likely caused by shell tools used to butcher animals, cut plants or clean fish. Neanderthals, who lived used shells as tools as well, though there is evidence that they broke the shells before sharpening them. The presence of a shell tool could explain the scarcity of stone tools at Indonesian hominin sites. This has always been a mystery to me. How would they butcher animals if they didn't have stone tools? It makes sense that the Java humans would simply use what they had available, but without further evidence of shell tools, it's difficult to be certain. Because these carvings go deep into the calcium carbonate shell, evidence of the pattern has survived for centuries. Other shells, however, may have had more superficial engravings. When it was new, the white shell would have been protected by a leathery brown outer layer, and a carved pattern on such a dark canvas would have stood out. A single shell with what appears to be a geometric pattern, zigzag grooves carved into the center of the outer shell, is perhaps even more intriguing. The patterns were carved on purpose, according to the analysis. The team returned to modern muscles for inspiration, carving similar patterns with a shark tooth and comparing the results to weathering and natural abrasions. Their carvings were, indeed, the closest matches to the ancient pattern. That must have been an appealing thing for Homo erectus. You can imagine sitting there with a shell in one hand and a tool in the other, ready to open the shell for food, but then scratching it, and seeing this white line appear. The researchers estimated the age of the shells using two dating techniques on preserved sediment, between 540,000 and 430,000 years old. The team also examined the Homo erectus bones with x-rays to confirm that they came from the same rock layer as the shells. Geometric pattern creation may represent a higher level of creativity in Homo erectus than previously thought, or such patterns may not be the artistic masterpieces we believe them to be. 
This forces us to reconsider not only Homo erectus capabilities, but also the criteria we use to assess our own species' behavioral evolution. Given that other Homo erectus populations used stone technology around the same time, the tools and scratches aren't completely incompatible with hominin abilities. The descendants of Homo erectus lived on Java until around 100,000 years ago, making the possibility that these practices persisted as part of Homo erectus culture even more intriguing. That would imply that the early members of this species possessed the incipient ability to impose a creative pattern on an object. These findings rekindle the long-running debate over the origin and dispersal pathways of archaic humans and call for a rethinking of the out-of-Africa paradigm, which provides a global roadmap for the dispersal of the genus Homo but whose one-way direction may be called into question. Instead of a unidirectional out-of-Africa model, a multidirectional shuttle dispersal model is more likely to explain the complex phylogenetic connections among African and Eurasian species and all populations of archaic humans according to a recent peer-reviewed study.